Hello, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Apostolos Yanakidis. I'm Greek, obviously. <coughs> uh, I'm, uh, I'm, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm a security architect at uh, the uh, So, I forgot about this. Uh, I have been uh, working, I have been in, I have a great interest in application security since forever. Uh, I remember I was hacking Greek websites in 1999, but uh, it was, uh, I, it was my profession, it became my profession for the last few years, for the last four years, as uh, I'm doing security research, application security research, uh, and it's a fascinating uh, area. That I will, I'm uh, inviting you all to Google about it and search more about it about runtime virtualization, and I will show you how runtime virtualization can solve many of the vulnerabilities that we all hear about, uh, and the solutions to all these vulnerabilities are heuristics and incomplete solutions. Uh, we don't have complete for most of these uh, vulnerabilities. We don't have complete solutions, and uh, this new field, runtime virtualization solves many of these problems. So I'm doing a little bit of R&D product development. Uh, I have more than 10 years of experience in software and security. So I do have a PhD. Switch your microphone. Yeah. 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 I think that's okay. Okay. I don't have a PhD. That's great. I have a uh, MSc. Okay. So uh, today we're going. To, I'm going to talk to you about Java decentralization. Uh, a vulnerability, which, in my opinion, it shouldn't be a vulnerability. Uh, it is a very uh, famous vulnerability, has become very famous in the last two years. And it is a vulnerability because of a serious flaw in Java, in my opinion. Uh, so we will discuss about the basics of serialization, what is serialization. We will discuss the basics of the serialization attacks. We will understand the vulnerability and the exploits, how the exploit works. And this is important so we can understand the, the mitigation, the solution. What is the solution to the problem? Uh, I will solve, I, I will clarify some misconceptions about this attack. Uh, I will uh, dis discuss known uh, mitigations, existing mitigations, and their disadvantages and advantages. And uh, at the end, I will introduce you to a, a new approach. Uh, some, I, I, I'm not trying to sell something here. I, I, I want you to think about uh, a different approach how to solve the problem. <coughs> And at the end, here. So, serialization basics. What is serialization? Uh, actually, before I start the presentation, I'd like to ask you who here, uh, I know we have a Java, Java champion in the audience. Uh, who here knows Java? Who here knows how to? Perfect. Okay. Who here knows how, to, how serialization works internally? Perfect. Okay. And a final question Who here has the ability to stop a code from reaching the production because of a security vulnerability? OK, perfect. Uh, so I have some questions for you later. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so serialization, basics. Uh, Object-oriented programming languages work with objects. Objects live in memory. Sometimes we have use cases that we want to transfer this object to, from, from one computer to another computer, or to store it in a file. The process of converting uh, an object that lives in memory uh, into a byte stream, into binary, uh, it's called serialization. And we do this to store it in files, databases, networks, to transfer it over the network, etc. The opposite process now, it's called deserialization. We convert the binary into an object into memory. Uh, I think uh, an important thing here to note is the arrows. And I, I, I like the, I'd like to stress the arrows. Uh, we will see actually the use cases. Uh, serialization was developed in order to transfer objects from one JVM, one Java virtual machine, one runtime platform, to another runtime platform, or the same runtime platform after, after, you, you, uh, you, uh, after the, the serialized object <coughs> exits the JVM and then enters the JVM, either the same JVM or another uh, JVM. And uh, I think that's, important to, uh, that's an important thing to understand. The moment the serialized object exits the JVM, we lose trust. It's not trusted anymore. And when, when it enters the JVM again, the, the runtime platform, 
it should be treated as untrusted by definition. So these are the use cases. And you might be using one of these technologies. And th these are important because I will explain the, the attack. Uh, I will explain the impact of the attack. And if you're using one of these technologies or protocols, you might be affected. This is your attack vectors. So you need to know about it. You need to research your infrastructure about these technologies. So what is so when we serialize an object, what, what do we see? What is the end result? The end result is a binary. It's a stream of bytes that contains data. It doesn't contain code. If it if it contained code, we would have been screwed since day one. It, it contains only data, the, the the values of the fields of the object, and metadata about the class and the fields of the class. Like this is a the, the name of the class is this. The name of the field is this. It also contains private data. So the moment you see LA is an object, encapsulation is broken. That's a different story, but I want to stress that I just want to highlight it. Serialization is not easy. If you believe that serialization is easy, you are mistaken. Uh, it's extremely easy to implement the, the interface, the serializable interface that tells Java that, you know, from that point on, that class, the instances of that class, can be automatically serialized and deserialized. That sounds easy, but it isn't. The reality is far more complex. Uh, and to do it securely, even more difficult. And it, it, it has been proven again and again. And I will show you. So I, I, we established that the, uh, the serialized, serialized objects are untrusted. Uh, the moment you implement serializable, that interface, you are the hidden constructor to your class. Even if your class is immutable, even if your class, meaning immutable means it doesn't change the state, it should, no one should change the state of that object, it's sacred. Even if uh, all your constructors are private, implementing serializable, you are the hidden constructor. Not everyone understands that. It's so hidden that you, you don't see it. You, you have to make an effort to change the behavior of that hidden constructor. And all your hidden, all your private fields, all your fields become public in, uh, uh, without even doing anything else than just implementing the interface. The deserialization process, because I, I'm not sure that everyone understands what deserialization is in reality, in practical terms. When we deserialize an object, we mean we create an object. The object didn't exist before, and during this realization, we create a new object, a new instance in memory, and we populate the, the fields of that object with the values from the stream. And we, ha we know that the stream is not trusted. It comes from outside of the JVM. So someone, someone can tamper with a, with a stream. Someone can create a stream, put uh, fake values or malicious values, and create objects in memory in the memory of your computer that has uh, malicious, uh, that, that you, you were not expecting these values. And it does, this, it does all of this without invoking any of your constructors, and this is important. Every developer here understands that I need to create a constructor, and in the constructor, I have security checks. I'm checking the invariance of my, uh, of my class. Invariant means something that shouldn't change. It's an absolute truth. Um, you do input validation in your constructor. Now, there's, as we have established, there is a hidden constructor. If you don't do the same things in your hidden, construct, hidden constructor, you are allowing an attacker or a user to create instances of that class with uh, invalid state. They can bypass your uh, constraints and your uh, security checks as easily as that. So treat it as a constructor. The hidden constructor of serialization should be treated as a constructor. And you should apply exactly the same con uh, constraints, everything. And your setters, again, the setters should have the same checks. OK, so serializable is a commitment. Uh, Serializable is a commitment from the development point of view. Every developer here, every Java developer, probably understand what this means. The moment you 
implement this interface, the serialized library interface, you're stuck with it. You, uh, you're, you can evolve your classes to a new, new versions, but pretty much you don't have flexibility. You're stuck with that class format, class higher. But it's also a commitment from the security point of view. If you had a class that didn't implement the serialized interface, the moment you implement that interface, the class now is untrusted. All the instances of this class are untrusted. So you lose trust of your class just, just by implementing an interface. So if you have untrusted instances in your system, you need to know about them. You need to create a thread model. You need to find all of your serializable classes, identify them, create a thread model, uh, and every time you have a new release, especially in Agile, every two weeks you have a new release, you have to reevaluate the same thread model again. You have to assess the risk profile of, the, of every class that implements serializable. And that's a commitment. You are adding this commitment to your developers. Not you. <laughs> you, I mean, uh, the developer manager or your colleagues. Uh, and most importantly, in my opinion, your code will perform, might perform deserialization. And deserialization uh, means object creation. And uh, you need to know exactly where this happens in your code. If you don't audit your code, either statically or dynamically, to identify the deserialization endpoints, you don't know where this uh, behavior m might come from, this malicious uh, behavior. So how we can attack serialization? Serialization, uh, attacks on serialization have been known since forever, since, since the on. Actually, serialization, uh, it's not even a, a problem of Java, I forgot to tell you about that. Serialization is a, is a mechanism of all uh, general programming operate, uh, object oriented programming languages. Java, Python, PHP, you name it, all of, them, all of these languages have serialization mechanisms. Uh, and all of them are flawed. So it's not a flaw of Java, it's not, it's not a bug in Java. Uh, and the specification of serialization, because there is a specification, secure, uh, it takes security into consideration. So there is a, a section in the specification that deals with security and uh, it has uh, even security goals. But they didn't, they didn't expect these new attacks. And they, uh, they knew that in theory something like that could be possible, but they didn't have proof. These researchers, standing on the shoulders of giants, as, they, as I like to say, identified new techniques to make significant damage during this realization using simple uh, payloads. Simple exploits. Well, they're, they're not so, so simple, but it can be very simple. I, I, I will show you examples. And using this kind of exploits, you can attack the integrity of your system, the integrity of the JVM, and the availability of the JVM. Uh, I'd like to clarify some misconceptions. How many of you might say, might believe that you're not using serialization, so you're safe? Why, why bother attending this stuff? Well, even if your code doesn't do serialization, your, the, your code, the application code, is not the only code that runs on the JVM. You have third-party components. You, your application runs on a framework. That framework has its own third-party components. And all of these runs on an application server. And that server has an, uh, another set of third-party components. And the third-party third, third -party components could have, have, could have transient uh, dependencies. It's a mess. Not only your code performs serialization. Serialization is used extensively. So probably you are using serialization. The names of these products and projects they uh, listed there is just a very small sample of projects and products that are vulnerable to Java deserialization attacks. Most, most people here use log4j. Some of you use Spring, Hibernate, you know, all vulnerable to Java virtualization. Who is affected? Well, almost everywhere. This again is a small list of the vendors whose products are vulnerable to Java virtualization attacks. If you're using a Cisco product, an Oracle product, I'm not against these vendors. 
on, they didn't do something wrong. That kind of attack wasn't was unknown uh, before. Uh, and I, in the end, I will uh, explain my, my rationale. It's not the problem of the vendors. It's not the problem of the developers. It's, uh, it's a problem of the runtime. And I will show you. I will demonstrate it. So let's visualize the, the vulnerability. Uh, these three lines of code do the damage. Just three lines of code. So most of you understand Java, if I understand correctly. So the first line of code says, I just received an HTTP request from the web. I'm getting the input stream, which is by definition untrusted. It comes from outside of the, our system. And then I'm passing that stream to object input stream. That's the name of the class that performs the serialization and, per, uh, and calls a read object. A read object, a read object is, is a method that calls the hidden constructor. It is the object that triggers the, 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 the deserialization process. What is the problem here? Well, they say that uh, if you read the documentation and OWASP and uh, other websites, you will, you will see there is no input validation. Yeah, in, uh, it's, it's very difficult to perform input validation at this level. Input validation, as I established before, has to happen inside your class. So if your class implements serializable, you have to override that hidden constructor I talked, uh, talked about before. And inside that hidden constructor, you have to do some input validation. And it's not even as simple as that. You have to do it correctly in a very specific way. Otherwise, again, you might be vulnerable. Another important point. A read object here, as I said, receives something untrusted from the web and tries to deserialize it. And then we're casting it to some object, to a type. <coughs> so it should be deserializing only that type. But that's not the case. That line of code there says, it's a, in, in a simple term says, give me any class you want, any class in the system that implements serializable. And I know of that class. And I will deserialize it for you. In other words, I will create an object any class. I think that's the most dangerous thing that you can do. You can deserialize anything. So I will explain later that these three lines of code can lead to arbitrary code execution, denial of service, and remote command execution. Remote command execution can lead to malware infection, ransomware infection. And if you believe that this is just a theory, November 2016, the San Francisco Muni uh, Municipal Transportation Agency, uh, SF Muni, had an incident. Someone managed to, uh, to infect 900 computers using this Java deserialization. They interrupted their services, or they didn't manage to inter disrupt the services, but they, they stopped the ticket machines from, from functioning. They couldn't issue new tickets. Based on their budget, we know that they were they lost around 500, uh, half a million US dollars every single day that they were not able to issue new tickets. I think this lasted for a day or two. And they exfiltrated a significant amount of data, including contracts and sensitive customer data. Contracts. Just because of the serialization uh, uh, vulnerability. Another misconception. Well, yes, I am using deserialization. I have audited my infrastructure, and I know that I'm deserializing the trust data. Well, what is trust data? And that's my problem with the definition of the of the vulnerability. The vulnerability is named deserialization of untrusted data. Well, we have, we established that all use cases of deserialization serialization expect input from outside of the JVM. There, there's little reason to use realization to deserialize something that exists already inside the JVM. Well, there might be, but it's not, it's not the main use case. 90%, 99% of the use cases, the input comes from outside. So by definition, your input is untrusted. So you shouldn't trust your data. If you, uh, I had a discussion with someone at the AppSec uh, EU in Belfast a few days ago, and he said, well, I trust my file system. 
I, dis I, I serialize something, I store it in my file system, and then I deserialize it, I know my file system is secure. <laughs> Don't you know about zero days? You might have a file upload zero day that can uh, compromise your file system. You don't even know about it. How can you trust something that lives outside of your system? By definition, it's untrusted. So these kind of attacks uh, abuse the uh, Java deserialization. Uh, and attackers found, found the way to, to deserialize it, to, sorry, to abuse this facility by creating something which is called as a gadget, not creating, sorry, by using something that's called a gadget. Now, uh, if I'm uh, being very uh, technical, I'm sorry for that, but I have to clarify these terms. It will help you understand uh, the consequence uh, the, 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 the later of the presentation. So any class that exists in your namespace, any class that, your, that the JVM, your runtime system can access, that implements the serializable interface, meaning that Java is able, in the previous slide, in, uh, in this, uh, this line of code, if this line of code has access to that class, may, it means that that class is serializable. Any serializable class, or externalizable, I'm not going to distinguish them now, uh, too technical. Uh, and these classes utilize their fields or their members during the serialization, meaning they, they have overridden that hidden constructor and they're doing something dangerous. Something dangerous from the point of view of the, of the attacker. From the point of view of the developer, it's fine. It's, it's normal code. It's, it's code that doesn't do anything harmful. Well, if they utilize the members, uh, the, the member, member fields and member methods without doing any input validation before that, then that's a dangerous class. And that qualifies to be named as a gadget class. Gadget classes exist in uh, application servers, application frameworks, uh, third-party components, and even inside the J JRE. The JVM itself has gadgets. And that's crazy. The most famous gadget uh, is the Apache Common Collection Invoker Transformer. That's, that was the, the tip of the iceberg. When this became famous, everyone lost their minds because this made uh, remote command execution possible. Uh, oh yeah, I know about the Invoker Transformer. I do have the Apache Common Collection in my on my class board. So I'm vulnerable. Well, no. Just because you have this class in your class path, it doesn't mean you're vulnerable. The vulnerability is the deserialization. That's the vulnerability. Now, if you also have the uh, Apache Common Collection in, on your class path, now it's an exploitable vulnerability. If you're not deserializing at all, you're not vulnerable. But most chances are somehow, somewhere, serialization, deserialization happens as we uh, establish. Let's see an example. I know this is a bit technical, but I think you will understand it. Uh, most of you understand code. So that's some class. Uh, that implements serializable. That's a very common example. You will find it online. Several other of, uh, security researchers uh, have presented that. I think Alvaro Munoz uh, first introduced it. So this class overrides that hidden constructor. Read object, read object is the hidden constructor. And it performs the default uh, deserialization, which populates that private field, the string, command. And then it uses the runtime class. The uh, runtime has a method, exec, which communicates with the operating system and executes that command on the operating system. Now, everyone is, uh, everyone here, uh, everyone in the security community calls this unrealistic gadget. Now, I want to ask Denise, where is Denise? Yeah, you have the ability to stop code into, uh, from going into production. Do you understand Java? Would you stop this gadget from going into production? <laughs> stop execs. <laughs> Why? Why wouldn't you, wouldn't you stop it? I love you. By design. Have you read my slides? 
This is a remote cell. <laughs> this is a remote cell by design. So if your developer in your company wrote this code, you might be tempted to say, let's put it in production. It's a feature. It's not a bug. It's a feature. It's by design. Well, it's a remote cell. It's a bug turning into your system. No sane person would ever deploy this into production, right? <laughs> and it's straightforward even for non-developers. If you just read the API, this is a remote shape, and it's, it's obvious. You don't need to be a security person to understand that this is obvious. That's why we call it unrealistic. No sane person, again, if you, correct me if, if you agree. I'll be worried if they hadn't done it on purpose. Yeah, exactly. So you might, you <laughs> might believe that they did it on purpose to add a backdoor. Yeah, absolutely. But would, would you would you sleep uh, relax at night if this was in production? Yeah. <laughs> 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 but it's the same thing as you know, like a, a web front end to a SQL query, right? Which is SQL injection by design. So the the, the interesting part is whether no. the developers understand it. Yes. Or okay. Where that was a yes, I agree. Okay, so. Pretty much the same, but uh, this one, I think it's even more obvious than SQL injection. Uh, SQL injection, let's say, before OWASP, like 10 years ago, it wasn't that obvious. But now, all may, may, mo most developers understand what SQL injection is. And I mo both of those points. Really? <laughs> yes. OK. So I, I believe, they, okay. in my opinion, new developers understand what injection means. But they have ed been, ed been educated at the basic level. Um, I'm, I, I'm not saying all of them, yeah, the majority. <laughs> okay. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, you have a point. You have a point. Most introductory, introductory books about programming are vulnerable, to provide a code that is vulnerable to SQL injection. I give you that. But that's not the point. Uh, anyway, what I want to say here is that reading the API of, uh, of the serialization, you immediately understand that this code uh, is a remote shell. Because it, it, uh, anything you give it, it executes the operating system. And <coughs> because this was an, an unrealistic example and you wouldn't want this in production, uh, so these kind of classes don't exist in production code. Attackers have to find a, a new way of attacking these classes. And they have created uh, something that's called gadget chain. And gadget chain is simply uh, uh, two, ma two classes calling one uh, a method of the other and then a method of another class. And at the end, they call runtime exec somehow. And that's a gadget chain. And the, the, the goal of the gadget chain is to abuse the digitalization logic into doing something malicious. Uh, this, uh, and gadget chains have to be self-executing. So, uh, attackers have to find a way that what they create, that gadget chain, is executed automatically without the user doing something or the application doing something. Uh, it, so it has to rely on the JVM. And one of the triggers is the hidden constructor. During this realization, it, uh, it might do something dangerous, calling a method, and that method can be the trigger for the execution of the gadget chain. Now, who, you know Scrabble, the game. And uh, I believe that if you cannot explain a concept easily to your mother, you don't understand the concept. And that's my approach on how to describe what a gadget saying is. My mom's a nurse. She didn't get that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, is she playing? Has she ever played Scrabble? <laughs> Has she ever played Scrabble? Uh, with me. And yeah, so, so she knows the rules of the game. So uh, pretty much, not exactly, but pretty much, gadget chains, uh, gadgets are letters of, the, uh, of words, and gadget chains are words. And if you manage to create a word, you won the game. Uh, the more letters you have, you have the, mo the more chances to uh, create the word. So every time you create a new class, that implements serializable, you add a new gadget in, in your system, you add a new letter 
to the attackers, and the attackers now have many letters, and they have more possibilities of creating new words, and the words win the game. If you don't believe me, probably all of you know this uh, project. Uh, tens of ready to use gadgets, just point and click, and you, you, you can execute, you can uh, exploit significant, um, you, you can exploit any system that depends on very popular frameworks like Spring, frame, uh, Spring Hibernate, etc. How do we mitigate this problem? Uh, there are several, several uh, ways to mitigate it. None of this, I believe, is enterprise scale. None of these um, solutions can scale to uh, organizations that have thousands of Java deployed, uh, uh, deployed uh, Java applications in production. Uh, we have been talking with customers that have thousands, uh, 50,000, 100,000 live instances in production, or maybe 50,000 different Java applications. Uh, and I will explain why th these mitigations are not uh, uh, applicable to enterprise scale. Uh, you should give, uh, I, first of all, you have, uh, I have to give the recommendation. Uh, the recommended way of solving the problem, redesign your application, re-architect your application. Uh, don't do it. <laughs> don't, don't do serialization. Object serialization natively in Java. Uh, avoid it and don't cost. Now, this will take time, but this will take money. Uh, and you will still be vulnerable. Uh, you may still be vulnerable uh, because you don't control all the code that you can re-architect. So you can re-architect your own application, but not the f server. Uh, web application firewalls. Don't let me go there. Uh, they, are, they have no context. They can just understand the stream. Some bytes in the stream, they see magic numbers. They see, they use heuristics, pattern matching. Oh, I found something that says invoke a transformer, so that's an exploit, so I'm stopping. Uh, they, that's, a that's a vulnerability inside the runtime. If you don't have access and visibility into the runtime, you cannot properly solve the problem, mitigate the, the attack. So we have to find a, 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 an exp, a, a mitigation inside the runtime. Uh, blacklisting, always but. Filter untrusted classes. You will, you will never have a complete blacklist. It's, it's, it's a way of saying uh, you will always fall behind. Uh, you will never be secure against zero days. Uh, no matter what you do. Uh, you have to constantly monitor lists and, uh, uh, over, uh, and events coming to OWASP to learn about new gadgets, etc. and you have to blacklist them. And even if you do so, they can be bypassed. I'm, I'm, I'm urging you to, to, to read this. Uh, I think they presented this in the serial killer. Yeah, they presented it in, in last year's UPSEC review. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, whitelisting, much better. Uh, but again, it requires profiling as blacklisting. You, you, you cannot widely, uh, you, you, you have a list. Everyone here joined this uh, event based on a whitelist. You added your name, you, you uh, emailed some, and some added you to this whitelist, and now you're able to join here. Same, same thing. But in, uh, in a Java application, it's very difficult, difficult to configure. How many of you know? What tools to use to identify which classes are needed for serialization? How how will you approach profiling? You you need you need specialized personnel. You need to educate your uh, developers and security teams to to use new tools. It's something that's very very low level at the code level, and security teams don't don't go that. Uh, deep into the code, usually, depending on, on the security team. So it's a very, it's also very difficult to configure. Uh, and if, if let's say you know an uh, exploit uh, uh, that uses that gadget, and you are also using that gadget, you have to whitelist it. And therefore, you give it a blessing, and you're saying, I have to comply. Uh, I have to, I have to have my functionality. Therefore, any exploit is welcome. Makes no sense. 
also golden gadgets. Golden gadgets are the type of gadgets that utilize only JRE classes. If you're using Java 7 U21 or below, there's nothing, nothing else is needed for, uh, for an attacker to exploit you uh, if you're deserializing. It doesn't depend on any third party component. That's, that's serious. That's very dangerous. Uh, maintaining a list is a commitment. You have to uh, have dedicated personnel that maintains the list. And if you're agile, you're releasing a new software every two weeks, every month, you have to profile again your application. Maybe a new class is needed to be whitelisted. Or you have to, as I said previously, you have to monitor security mailing lists and add uh, uh, gadgets to your blacklists. Uh, if you forget to add something to your blacklist, you're vulnerable. If you forget to add something to whitelist, you break your application. And you cannot do a risk management. It, it, you can, but it's very difficult, in my opinion, to do risk management. Who should be responsible to maintain these lists? Should, be, should it be developers? Should it be security people? Developers understand code. Security teams understand operations. If you tell them you have to uh, assess the risk of that class, and if you agree, then add it to your whitelist, that person has to be a developer. And developers don't understand risk management and security operations. And let me give you an example really quick. That class extends base class. Someone from the development team comes to you, Dennis, and asks you, I created a new functionality based on this class. I know you have a whitelist. Could you please whitelist this class for me? Because, because I need it for my functionality. You examine the code, you see nothing suspicious. What do you do? How much, how much time will you spend investigating that class? Yeah, so most probably you, you won't spend more time, you will whitelist it. Three days later, three o'clock in the morning, you have a, a phone call, someone compromised your system, and then you investigate it, and you realize that the base class extends the hash map, and the hash map is a JRE class, and there are known exploits for the hash map. And you didn't know about it. You, you, it's so difficult to do risk management. Oracle tried to solve the problem by introducing the new uh, functionality into the J JVM using filters. Three filters. Not one, three. You have to maintain three filters. Sure. One filter is uh, for security. People, one, another filter is deve for developers, and the third one is built in inside the JVM, and it whitelists some specific classes. And if these classes happen to become vulnerable in the future, these classes are already whitelisted. With the blessings of Oracle, someone can compromise the garbage collector of your, of your JVM. And it uses heuristics, patterns. It's very, diff very easy if you try to use these filters to mess up with the, the patterns and break your functionality. Uh, you can use a security manager. That's a good thing to do. How many of you are using the security manager for server-side Java applications? Perfect. OK, so that's a recommended thing to do. No one is doing it. OK, uh, again, it's whitelisting. It requires profiling, difficult to configure, can be bypassed. Two minutes. Uh, okay. Uh, we'll be kicked out otherwise. Okay, so that's a problem for me. Anyway, uh, that's an example of uh, of, of uh, an exploit. And what I want you to uh, what I want to show you here is that random exec. That's a stack trace during the attack. Uh, the, the point of the attack. This is what happens in, in uh, the, the runtime platform. The entry set is being invoked of a class called map, and somehow it executes runtime. Exact. It abuses the deserialization logic. Here, the link has set calls add to add a new uh, item in the list, in the set, and somehow it defines a new class. And if you define a new class, that's the definition of privilege escalation. If you're able to do that, what's the problem? The JVM is irrationally permissive without a security manager. No one is using a security manager, therefore everyone is uh, having a, a, the JVM irrationally too permissive. 
uh, does, the JVM doesn't protect you against API abuse and privilege escalation, makes zero effort to mitigate these attacks. Zero effort. If someone manages to <coughs> find the vulnerability, they can create new classes at runtime. That's nothing. And asking your developers, you go to that training, be a better developer, know how to write secure, uh, secure code, doesn't solve the problem. No matter what you do, uh, your developers will create new bugs and vulnerabilities, and also you don't control all the code that runs on the JVM. So I believe the problem is the runtime. The runtime should protect you against this kind of attacks. I forgot to say that the JVM, not, it's not even safeguarding its own invariants. We know that some things at runtime shouldn't be violated. For example, the string class is immutable. No one should change the contents of string. However, I can create an exploit in decentralization and change the contents of uh, string, for any string in the, uh, in the system, and all, all hell breaks loose. I can create two runtime instances, two system instances. The runtime doesn't protect you against any of this kind of abuse. It's irrational. It doesn't make sense. So we need a, s a system that is, by definition, secure. How do we do that? And I will run very quickly through the, the last slides. Uh, I believe that uh, during a runtime, the runtime platform should have more intelligence and should stop some, kinds, uh, some types of uh, attacks. Deserialization is one of these, uh, is one of these uh, types of attacks. Uh, privilege escalation. Mother says, isolate your code, compartmentalize your systems, have uh, explicit boundaries, minimize your privileges inside these compartments. And so we're doing exactly that. I'm suggesting to you that the runtime should compartmentalize the system at runtime and minimize automatically per permissions and safeguard its own invariants based on common sense. Defining new classes while you're adding an item into a hasset makes no sense. The, load, the, 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 the reason we're deserializing an object is to create a new object, not to create a new class. So some common sense in the runtime wouldn't harm. Uh, so if we do that, we also if we do micro compartments and nested one inside the other, we have fine grain visibility. We know what, what each compartment should be running. Uh, runtime virtualization. All this is possible only if you're uh, uh, using a platform that depends on virtualization. Security manager, no one is using it here apart from performance issues because it's very difficult to configure and because it can be bypassed. Why it can be bypassed? Because it runs in the same address space and namespace as the payload. If the payload that enters the JVM runs in the same address space as the security, the security control, what stops the payload from disabling that security control first and then do the damage? So you need security control outside of the address space of the payload or the application itself. The application itself, the whole thing should be untrusted. So virtualization does exactly that. Virtualization has, been, has evolved, has matured. Uh, we know how to do virtualization very in a, f efficiently. Last slide. Uh, one final thing, uh, using uh, runtime virtualization, we uh, need tainting, data tainting. Data tainting is important to uh, uh, distinguish between what came from the user, what came from an uh, outside source, and what came from inside the application. So we can track inside uh, the, ex uh, the execution what is untrusted and privilege the escalation. Inside the compartments, we, we know that API calls that mutate the state of the JVM shouldn't be allowed to do that. Mutating the graph, the deserialized graph, should be allowed. Uh, tainted I.O., no reason to do that. It's a remote shell by definition, by design. You, you don't want to do that. And anyway, if we implement all this, we have all these <coughs> benefits. With no source code changes, without filters, we uh, gain all these benefits. Just a, just a, just a, just a,
My final, uh, my final sentence. The runtime platform should be secured by default. It shouldn't be optional. You shouldn't be choosing to to run in a secure environment. Security shouldn't be something that you opt in. It's there by default. Okay. Thank you. Unfortunately, we have no time for questions. We're going to have a very quick five-minute uh, talk from Edwin, which is going to uh, continue on this thing. Can developers write secure code? And what can you do about it? Um, and Edwin is pretty, uh, looked at the one of the things that OWASP actually provides for developers. And uh, he came up with an interesting suggestion that perhaps you can utilize. Huh. 